The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome everyone to Nova 401k Associates webinar, Introduction to 401k Plans for Plan Sponsors with Charlene DiMartini and Christine Hall. Before we get started, I would like to point out the panel on the top right-hand corner of your screen. You will see a drop-down section, and this is for your questions. Uh, this is where you will enter in any questions you may have for Charlene and Christine. They will answer as many questions as time permits. Please be sure to make your questions as descriptive as possible. If time runs out and you still have questions, please send them to our email address, webinars at nova401k.com. Right below questions, you will see the handouts drop down. Here you will be able to download today's material. If you're with us today to earn continued education credits, please be sure to stay until the end to fill out the survey. This will allow us to track your time and participation. Certificates will be sent out within a week for those who have met the time requirements. To view any webinars you may have missed and the recording of this session, you can follow us on our YouTube channel, which is Nova 401k Associates, or visit our website, which is www.nova401k.com backslash webinars. Thank you for joining us today. I would now like to introduce from NOVA's Defined Contribution Administration team, Charlene DiMartini and Christine Hall. Hi, everyone. I'm Christine Hall, and I'm one of the senior account managers here at NOVA 401k Associates. Um, I realize that a lot of you that are listening in have a brand new 401k plan, so I want to congratulate you on that. There's a lot of information um, to learn about 401k plans, so we're going to try to go over as much as we can today um, in our presentation of Introduction to 401k Plans for Plan Sponsors. Um, the presentation is going to be about 90 minutes long, but before we get started, I just want to go through our disclaimer. Please note that the information in this presentation is general in nature and not intended to be a substitute for legal or tax advice. Please consult a qualified professional such as an attorney or accountant if you need legal or tax advice. Also know that some of you um, in the webinar today are getting continuing ed credits. If you need CPA credit, NOVA's provider number is 0098-20. You'll need to register individually, and you need to be present for this entire seminar. You need to complete the evaluation form at the end, and you will receive a certificate within one week. So like I said, we have a pretty big agenda today, so we're going to jump right in. Just to give you an overview of what we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about the roles and responsibilities in a 401k plan. Nova, NOVA's cybersecurity measures, 401k basics, the moving pieces in a 401k plan, distribution basics, loan basics, and finally we're going to end out with NOVA's annual calendar so that you have a good idea of what your year is going to look like. So getting right into plan administration roles and responsibilities. You can see this little graphic here shows that there's four main entities that help to run a 401k plan. The first one in the top left corner is the plan sponsor, and that would be you who um, established the 401k plan. Um, your responsibilities as plan sponsor um, are the overall fiduciary responsibilities. You're responsible for communicating the plan to your employees, and you're also responsible for um, depositing contributions that your employees make, and you um, need to provide on an annual basis uh, data to the third-party administrator so that they can do the testing for your plan, and in this case, NOVA would be the third-party administrator. Right beside plan sponsor is financial advisor um, or plan broker. And that individual 
will help the plan sponsor to assist in um, selecting a vendor, um, the investment provider or record keeper. So selecting where the money is going to be invested, selecting the funds, options that are in the plan, and monitoring them. They will help the plan sponsor coordinate enrollment meetings for employees as they become eligible for the plan and provide investment education um, to the participants. And they will assist the plan sponsor with um, being 404C compliant. And that means having a good mix of different investment options so that the participants can pick um, a good prudent investment mix to be able to maintain that 404C compliance. Then right below plan sponsor is investment provider. And that's also sometimes called your record keeper or custodian. That is where the plan assets are actually held. Um, the investment provider's responsibilities are to invest the plan contributions and provide daily record keeping for the plan. So the participants are, can log on to the investment provider's website and be able to see the value of their accounts on a daily basis. They'll also provide statements to all plan participants and statements are required on a quarterly basis. Um, they may be sent directly to participants' home address or they could be delivered electronically to them if the participant chooses to have their statement that way. And this would also be where the participants go to get a distribution withdrawal um, and different, you, the plan sponsor could go there to get reporting on the plan. Then finally, beside investment provider is your third party administrator. And that is NOVA 401k Associates. And what NOVA's role in the plan is to basically make sure that your plan is in legal compliance. There's a lot of laws behind 401k plans and um, NOVA wants to make sure that you're staying legal. And to do that, we will prepare and maintain the plan document. We'll complete the required annual compliance testing and we'll prepare annual filings for your plan, the required filing, which is the Form 5500. And we'll also provide you with ongoing plan consulting. So, um, you know, if you ever need to make changes to the way your plan's running um, or think you might need to make changes, you know, please contact your account manager here at NOVA um, and we'll be glad to go through that with you. But before we get into um, the particulars on 401k, I think it's important to, um, in today's world, to understand NOVA's cybersecurity measures, because we're going to be asking you for data on your employees that, um, you know, includes a lot of confidential information, like social security numbers and names and dates of birth and compensation amounts. So, we want you to make, to feel comfortable that NOVA is being careful with your data and that we are up to date with our cybersecurity measures. There's a tremendous amount of money in 401k plans. And for sure, the bad guys, as I have quoted there, have taken notice to this. So 401k plans have become a target um, for people trying to um, get money um, that they really shouldn't be getting. Um, what they'll do is they'll coordinate tax on the record keepers where the money's kept and that could start um, from a phishing attack um, or a hack on an employee's email. Hackers would then contact the record keeper and reset that employee's password um, and with the new password the attacker could request loan or distribution as if they were the employee. Um, with ACH and wires, this can happen really quickly. Um, and unfortunately, it could be a big amount of money that um, 
is stolen, but unfortunately, typically it's only a trivial amounts that are recovered when the theft is discovered. So it is something we need to be really careful about. And this type of theft is not covered by the plant's fidelity bond, by fiduciary insurance, or by E&O insurance. So we all have to be alert and do our part to prevent fraudsters from succeeding. Some of the information that we're gonna ask you for is census files. Um, the record, the plans record keeper, you know, will also often want census files as well. Um, deferral files, payroll files, and address files. We use this information, the census information, to do non-discrimination testing. Um, once we do the non-discrimination testing, we want to give that back to you. But within that testing, there's also sensitive information. The ADP, the top heavy test, the 415, 402G, and 401A test all have information in them um, about specific to employees that a fraudster would love to get their hands on. Most software will mask social security numbers now, but not all of them do. We'll also want to give out our annual reports to you. And what we do is we have a secure file exchange and our plan sponsor link that we can put this information on so that we're not sending it through to you through email. We also ask that you use our plan sponsor link to submit information to us. Um, we're coming quickly to the end of the year and that means we will be asking for census information for 2022. And we certainly want you to use that um, census request that we'll put out to you on our plan sponsor link so that it can be given to us securely. On occasion, we might ask for some tax forms like W-2 forms, K-1s, or Schedule Cs. And that's another thing that you never want to send through regular email. You can use the secure file exchange on our plan sponsor link to get us that information securely. And I just put, you should never send any of this information um, via email without encryption. So if you have a way to encrypt it, that's fine too. Here's our address for our plan sponsor link and how to get to our secure portal. Um, Nova also has encryption software that we use. Um, to look at emails before we get them to make sure, um, you know, if there's anything that seems wrong about them, you know, that'll go on to alert. It won't just go into one of our employees' inboxes without being checked first. Um, in order to be a plan contact for NOVA, um, you know, if someone needs to get added as a new contact, um, you know, maybe you're the trustee of the plan, but you'd like someone on your HR team to be one of our contacts. We need to be notified about that before and anyone can be added to the system. That person in HR can't just call us up and say, hey, can you add me for such and such plan? You know, we'll want to go back to you, um, the plan trustee who is already authorized um, to have access to the plan to get that authorization before adding them. All employees at NOVA have mandatory training every quarter um, on cybersecurity. And we do this because we want to make sure that we're up to speed with things, that we're being diligent about um, looking for things that look suspicious. And also, NOVA has a password policy for all employees where passwords are changed at least every 90 days. All of that's done to make sure that your sensitive data is kept safe and secure. Um, we want you to use that census upload function on plan sponsor link to submit the annual census to us. You can use the secure file transfer features on our website too. Um, you know, if there's any information that you need to get to us outside 
of that um, census data request. Like if you do get your, some of your compensation through a K-1 to get us that information, we ask that you use that secure file exchange. Another thing that you can do is limit the number of people that you copy on emails. Um, you know, if it's not someone that needs to get the information, you don't need to copy them on the email. And remember to use complex passwords and change them often. Now that you feel a little bit more secure about Nova's cybersecurity, um, want to jump into 401k basics. 401k plans are so popular because they give employees an opportunity to save for retirement on a pre-tax basis. And for employees, it is a relatively easy way to save. Um, they set up how much they want um, to contribute to the plan through payroll deduction and for many people, that's their biggest savings um, outside of their home. And so it's really a valuable benefit for employees having a 401k plan. So even though 401k plans are relatively easy for employees and they're designed to be that way um, so that they can set up what they'd like to defer and how they want to invest it and then be a little bit more hands off. Um, they are heavily regulated by both the IRS and the Department of Labor. So as a plan sponsor, um, it's important to you know, gain some knowledge on your 401k plan so that you can stay within the IRS's and the DOL's guidelines. Unfortunately, with the IRS and DOL, regulations, it's, they're not always common sense. You know, sometimes you think, oh, that may, would make sense for the 401k plan to be run that way. That's logical, if you will. That's not always the case. Um, and the rules can frequently change just like any other government rules. Um, and what's really gonna be most important for you is that plan document that NOVA is going to help you to put in place because that is the rule book for your plan. Um, so that is also really important that you don't make assumptions that, oh, I think my plan's set up this way. Um, you want to make sure in that plan document that that's the case because most times if you reach out to your account manager here at NOVA, one of the first things, and you're asking questions specific um, about your plan features, that account manager is going to be pulling up the plan's adoption agreement, which is part of the plan document. Now, how the IRS factors into 401k plans, um, the IRS wants to make sure that your plan is in compliance with the federal statutes and IRS regulations. Um, one of the requirements that the IRS has is non-discrimination testing that needs to be done on an annual basis. And we'll talk about some of that um, non-discrimination testing coming up. They look at taxable events and deduction limits. That comes from the IRS. And they wanna make sure that your plan document is amended timely. And in fact, they even require, the IRS requires that plan documents are all restated about every, every six years to make sure that new legislation is being included in those plan documents. And the IRS, if they would ever audit your plan, are going you know, to want a copy of your plan document and make sure that you're following the terms in that plan document. Then we have the Department of Labor. And the Department of Labor looks at 401k plans a little bit differently than the IRS. Their main goal is to make sure that employees are benefiting in the way they should from the plan and that they are being treated fairly in regards to the plan. So the IRS really looks to make sure that the 401k contributions that employees make and the loan repayments, if they take a loan from the plan, are being deposited timely into 
the plans account at the record keeper. They're gonna look at the funds that are offered um, in the plan and make sure that that, that that fund lineup is prudent so that participants can be making good investment choices. They'll look at the expenses that are paid by the participants um, in order to run the plan to make sure that the expenses are reasonable. And there's annual reporting that needs to be given to the submit it to the Department of Labor, and that is called the Form 5500. And again, we will be talking about the Form 5500 more coming up. Now, I did say that sometimes the rules that the IRS and the Department of Labor have are not common sense. So I wanted to give a couple examples of that. Um, to make sure that you don't fall into these kind of pitfalls. So here in the first example, a plan sponsor wants to exclude hourly employees from his 401k plan. That can be done as long as the testing passes for excluding hourly employees. But in order for that to be done, the plan document must be written to exclude hourly employees. You don't ever want to think, oh, if I want to exclude someone from the plan, you know, I, I should be able to do that as long as I'm being fair and do it, you know, do it to everyone in that situation across the board. That is true, but it's not really a part of your plan unless it's in that plan document. So you want to make sure that if you want to exclude any employees from your plan, that it is stated as such in your plan document. And then if you're excluding some employees from your plan, there will be coverage test, additional coverage test that needs to be passed in order to be able to do that. And in a lot of cases that testing will pass, but you wanna make sure that you're communicating that to your account manager at NOVA so that we can make sure that your plan document is up to date and that the proper testing is being done and passing. Another example is, what is the preferred investment alternative for an employee who puts money into a 401k plan but fails to make an investment selection? So here you have an employee that wants to contribute to the plan, but maybe he or she um, isn't comfortable with making an investment choice so they choose to do nothing. Or maybe they're not even making 401k contributions, but they, you as plan sponsor decide to make a profit sharing contribution to the plan and the employee is eligible to receive the contribution, but because he or she never made 401k contributions to the plan does not have an investment selection. So what happens in that case? Well, originally, and I, and I have up until fairly recently on here, but it was actually a little bit longer than fairly recently ago, um, you know, common sense said, oh, well, if they didn't make an investment choice, let's put this in the money market fund or a stable value fund. So it's kind of like a savings account. You know, those accounts um, don't go negative in their value because they don't move along with the stock market, but in more recent times, the Department of Labor has said, no, you can't do that because if that person's money was invested for years and years in a money market fund, they would not be keeping up with inflation. So in essence, they'd be losing money. So according to the Department of Labor's regulation, your default fund needs to be a balanced fund or a life cycle fund. Again, that might not be common sense, but that is important. And that is something that your investment advisor can help you to set up a proper balanced fund or life cycle fund as that default fund at the record keeper for participants who have not made an investment choice. I had brought up that the Department of Labor really looks to make sure that timely deposits are made. 
and this is a, a very important thing. Um, so much so it's even asked as a question on the form 5500 that needs to be filed to the Department of Labor each year. They do, the Department of Labor does give some guidance for plans um, on the timing of when they need to have contributions deposited into the participants' accounts. If your plan's considered a small plan, and small plans are plans that have less than 100 participants in them, the Department of Labor says that the contributions need to be deposited into participants' accounts within seven business days after it's withheld. And actually, the sooner um, that it can get in, the better. So I wouldn't you know, suggest to always hit that seventh business day. What the Department of Labor is really looking at is that making deposits into your 401k plans account is part of your payroll process. That's an ideal situation. And that as soon as payroll is processed, that within seven business days after that, consistently those contributions are being made. Now, if you have a large plan, and that is when you have a plan or that is more than 100 participants, the Department of Labor gets a little bit stricter um, on those rules. Historically, the rule was 15 business days after the month following the contributions were made. And that kind of still sits there. Um, it was never revoked, but it's not something that the Department of Labor is looking for anymore. I like to bring it up though, because every now and then a plan sponsor will come to me and say, hey, Christine, I thought the rule was 15 business days after the month following the contributions were made. And yes, that is the rule, but that's not really what they're looking for because their new rule really trumps that rule. And that rule is as soon as administratively possible. So again, what they're looking for is they're looking for it being part of your payroll process and a consistent process taking place where payroll happens, then contributions are deposited at the record keeper. And really, as soon as administratively possible, just to give you a feeling on that, we're looking at three to five business days, you know, certainly sooner than that seven business day. And they're looking for patterns. So if the Department of Labor would come in and audit your plan, um, they're certainly going to, this is one of their most important items, if you will, that they're going to be looking at the timing of when contributions were made. And let's say you consistently make the deposit a day after the pay date. If you get paid on Fridays, the deposit goes in on Mondays and they see that consistently. And let's say you have an outlier that might have instead of being deposited on that Monday, wasn't deposited until Friday. The IRS might even point that out as that's late, that's out of your pattern of your normal administration. So really it's important to establish a pattern and you know, keep that part of your payroll process in the same way you would payroll, you know, not have payroll happening late. If your plan's a large filer, it's also going to be audited, need an audit on an annual basis um, by a CPA. And that is something that they also look at the timing of deposits because they wanna make sure that your plan is in good order if it were ever audited by the Department of Labor. I've been bringing up this form 5500. Um, it is the annual report that needs to be submitted to the Department of Labor. Um, it's kind of like an annual tax filing, although 401k plans are tax deferred, so it's not a tax form, um, but is similar in that way. It is required to be electronically filed. They won't, the Department of Labor won't take it any other way, but electronically. And the information that's reported on the Form 5500 is all at the plan level. It doesn't report anything specific to any participants. So there's no um, 
confidential information given on the Form 5500. In fact, um, Form 5500s are public knowledge, publicly accessible on the Department of Labor's website. You know, anyone could go out there and access a Form 5500 for any plan. Um, because again, it doesn't have any participant specific information. What it does contain is it contains participant counts for the year, certain fees that are paid from the plan, the plan's income statement, and the plan's financial statement. And the good news is that NOVA will prepare that Form 5500 for you each year so that when you get it, all you need to do as plan sponsor is to review what we prepared um, for reasonableness and electronically sign and submit it. One of the things that needs to be reported on the 5500 is the plan's fidelity bond. So you wanna make sure that you have a fidelity bond for your plan. And if your plan is a large filer, which means that it has more than 100 participants, you'll also need to include with that Form 5500 um, an audit report. And that will need to be prepared by an independent CPA. There are some transition rules. Um, you know, if your plan starts out as a small plan, but you're kind of close to that 100 um, mark, um, and you already filed as a small plan, when you hit the 100 mark, it won't immediately mean that you are, are requiring an audit. Um, the Department of Labor gives you until you hit 120 people. Once, so, you know, you'll have a little bit of time to um, know that that audit's coming up um, because the audit is, um, it certainly takes extra time um, on your part as plan sponsor to go through that audit with the CPA and that is an, also an added expense to your plan. So that transition rule is nice because it gives you a heads up before your plan um, gets into the audit situation. So I said before um, that it's really important um, for the record keeper to get those contributions timely, it's something that the Department of Labor looks at. One of the ways that you can um, help that to happen and maybe be a little bit more hands off on that as a plan sponsor is to set up payroll integration. So what is payroll integration? Um, what happens is your payroll provider that you use will submit full census data to each pay period to um, the record keeper, to the custodian where the assets of the plan are held. The information that is submitted includes addresses, dates of birth, dates of hire, dates of termination, compensation, and deferral data. And it includes all employees, even if they're not deferred for the plan. So it'll be your entire census for that pay period. What that does is it gives that record keeper um, all the information they need to be able to send those quarterly statements to participants, um, to know when those participants are eligible to receive a distribution based on their termination date. And for the employees that are not yet participating in the plan, it gives the record keeper information so that they can have things set up so that when that employee becomes eligible for the plan or decides that they would like to start contributing to the plan, they can go on to the record keeper's website and set that up. So why would you want to use payroll integration? Well, it certainly does make things a little bit more hands-off for you as plan sponsor and helps to organize your plan a little bit more. Your annual census data can then be pulled from the record keeper's website. You know, if you're um, submitting that to them throughout the year and you could use that to help um, 
to complete the annual census data request that NOVA asked you to do. If the record keeper is getting information, um, dates of termination on your participants, then once they know that that person is no longer employed with you, they can send out information to um, take distributions from the plan. And if the account is under $5,000, they would even be allowed to force out a distribution if there's no response after 30 to 45 days after they've been notified. And that's good because that will keep, prevent small accounts from hanging around your plan. And if you would be a plan that is getting close to that 100 mark to make you a large plan, um, having small accounts not hanging around could also help you to stay under that 100 mark and prevent the need from um, the need for getting a plan audit. It also allows um, the record keeper or vendor to track enrollment. So once a new employee um, meets the plan's eligibility requirements, uh, the record keeper could send enrollment packets to the participant. Um, and this would be particularly um, useful if your plan is using automatic enrollment as well. And census data is updated at the vendor when they get those payrolls. Again, so address changes, um, are being updated on a payroll basis so that there's good communication between the record keeper and your employees. And it would also update them if you have an employee who was a former employee who was rehired. So there's two types of payroll integration and you'll wanna check with your payroll provider and also with the record keeper that you're using to see which types that they could mutually be set up for. The best type I would say, which is the most hands-off for you as a plan sponsor would be payroll 360. And that's when the census data flows both ways. So your payroll provider will provide the record keeper with the information from each payroll. And then in turn, the record keeper will provide your payroll provider with updates that they received on their website, like deferral changes, hardship withdrawal requests, or loan requests, so that they would know to make deferral changes or um, to start loan payments as um, the payroll provider. Now, not all payroll providers and record keepers can be set up for payroll 360. So the other option um, is payroll 180, and that's where the information is just going from your payroll provider to the record keeper. If you have that kind of setup, anything that happens at the record keeper, so those deferral changes, those loan requests that are going to now require loan repayments, you as plan sponsor would have to communicate those types of changes to your payroll provider so that they can put those in place and um, have those updates in a timely manner. I have mentioned non-discrimination testing um, that's required on an annual basis for your plan. So I wanna go over a little bit of that so that you understand you know, what NOVA is going to be testing, what requ what's required, the tests that are required for your plan to pass. The first one for 401k is the ADP testing, which is average deferral percentage. And what this test does, it compares the amount of the deferrals of your highly compensated employees um, to the amount of the deferrals to your non-highly compensated employees. And typically, when looking at this, it's there, you know, the IRS does leave some leeway. Um, typically, on average, they'll allow highly compensated employees to contribute 
2% more than your non-highly compensated employees on average are deferring. But when it gets outside of those limits that the IRS allows, the testing fails. And if your testing fails, then the highly compensated employees would need to receive a refund of their 401k contributions in order for the testing to pass for that year. So who is a highly compensated employee? For 2022, any employee in the testing year that earned more than $130,000 in the prior year, which would mean in 2021, is a highly compensated employee for 2022. So you always look back to what was earned in the prior year. Um, so for 2022, we're looking at 2021, anyone that made at least 130,000. Since we're getting close to the end of this year, also think it's important to share with you that for 2023, we'll look at 2022's compensation and anyone who earned at least 135,000 in 2022 will be considered a highly compensated employee for 2023. Now, regardless of what the person's compensation is, anyone who is greater than a 5% owner is automatically considered a highly compensated employee, even if they make under that um, highly compensated compensation threshold. And anyone that is a lineal family member or spouse to a greater than 5% owner is also considered a highly compensated employee through ownership attribution. Another test, non-discrimination testing, that we need to do is called top-heavy testing. And what top-heavy testing does is it uses another group of employees. The IRS likes to keep it interesting for us. So instead of looking at highly compensated employees, the top heavy testing looks at key employees and it looks at the account balances of the key employees and their account balances in total. If they're more than 60% of the total plan assets, then your plan is considered top heavy for that year. And top heavy plans are required to make contributions to non key employees. Um, so it's important to realize if your plan's going to be top heavy or not, because if your plan is top heavy, it does hold that contribution requirement to the non key employees. So the way we determine who is a key employee is any employee who has greater than 5% ownership, so that's the same way um, as an HC is determined, and also any lineal family member or spouse of a 5% owner, their family attribution is also a key employee. But here's where it gets a little bit different. Um, it looks at anyone who is at least a 1% owner and has compensation greater than $150,000 is considered a key employee, or an officer with compensation greater than 185,000 would be a key employee. So one of the things that you'll find when you get our annual census data request is we ask for all the ownership percentages in your company, we ask for officers, and of course we ask for our family relationships, and the reason we that NOVA asked for all that information is so that we can correctly calculate who the highly compensated employees in your plan are and who are the key employees. Now, some of you may have or are in the process of putting in a safe harbor plan. And the good thing is that safe harbor plans um, are exempt from the ADP testing. Um, the ACP testing is what tests the match. 
and the top heavy test. And that is great news because um, you might have been listening to um, that last couple, you know, explanations and thinking, my plan's not going to pass the ADP test or, you know, my plan's going to be top heavy. But if you have a safe harbor plan, it's exempt um, from those two tests. You get an automatic pass on it as long as you are meeting the safe harbor plan requirements. And what those are is there's two types of safe harbor plans. You can either set up a safe harbor plan with a safe harbor match or with a non-elective contribution. And the safe harbor matching formula, the basic formula is 100% of the first 3% deferred by employees plus 50% of the next 2% that's contributed. So that means that any of your employees that contribute at least 5% to the plan would receive a 4% match. The non-elective safe harbor um, is not a match and it's a 3% contribution that would be given to all eligible employees whether or not they contribute to the plan. So, and in both of these cases, in order to be safe harbor contributions, they need to be 100% vested, which means that if that employee would end their employment with you, no matter how long they've been with you, that money would be 100% theirs. You cannot put a vesting schedule on that. In addition to um, the ADP testing, the top heavy testing, there are some tests that need to be done for all plans, even safe harbor plans, and that would be coverage testing, and that is making sure that um, if you are excluding any employees from your plan, um, whether they're not um, in your plan, if they're not allowed to be in your plan, that, that the highly compensated employees are not um, overly benefiting compared to the nine highly compensated employees. All these testings are gonna be com comparing your highly compensated employees, how they're benefiting through the plan to how your non-highly compensated employees are benefiting. If you decide to make a profit sharing contribution to the plan, um, there's testing that needs to be done. Again, comparing um, the percentage of contribution that your highly compensated employees are getting to what your non-highly compensated employees are getting. And there's also compensation testing. If you would choose to exclude a certain type of compensation from your plan, like let's say you're not going to include bonuses as plan eligible compensation, then there would be additional testing that would need to be done um, for any kind of compensation exclusions. Again, all of that needs to be in your plan document. Um, plan documents need to be amended timely. Um, so usually what, how NOVA delivers your plan document will be through DocuSign. Um, so when you get a DocuSign with your plan document and adoption agreement, you wanna be sure to review that and electronically sign that as soon as possible so that your plan document is put into place in a timely manner. Um, like I said earlier, the IRS does require, have required plan document restatements about every six years. And so that's also important um, to be done in a timely manner. If you would want to make changes to your plan and there'd be amendments to your plan document, Again, you want to um, execute that timely um, because there are um, penalties, financial penalties, when your plan document is not um, kept up in a timely manner. The plan document, like I said, it's, it's the rule book for your plan. So some of the items that are going to be um, explained in your plan document is eligibility. Um, it's going to define what employees, maybe their age they need to meet, meet um, and how long they have to be with you to be eligible for the plan, the entry dates, 
Um, it will define compensation, um, employer contributions that you may make to the plan, as well as vesting. There are some common errors we see when we um, take over a new plan and even just common errors that we see for new plan sponsors. So I just wanna go over these with you quickly so that you can try to avoid these. Um, excluding bonuses from deferral elections. If that's not in your plan document, that bonuses are excluded from compensation, then you must take um, deferrals from bonuses. Excluding part-time employees from the plan. Um, the IRS does not um, have a way to exclude part-time employees. You could exclude employees that work under a thousand hours from your plan, um, but not blanket statement part-time employees. Um, you know, the IRS always looks at the hours that employee works. Matching catch-up contributions separately from non-catch-up contributions. So for participant, for employees that are age 50 or over, they can make an additional 401k contribution, which is called a catch-up contribution. For 2022, it allows people who are at least age 50 to contribute an additional 6,500. Um, when you're calculating the match, you don't want to do that separately on those um, catch-up contributions. You want to add all the contributions together, both the regular, the non-catch-up contributions, the catch-up, and calculate the match in that way. Same way if anyone is making Roth contributions. You don't want to calculate that separately. You want to add your pre-tax and your Roth 401k together and then calculate the match. You want to be sure that you're distributing the summary plan description. That is very important to the Department of Labor. Um, when a new employee is becoming eligible for the plan, make sure that they have a copy of the summary plan description because that explains to them in layman's terms what the plan is um, and what their benefits are in the plan. Not allowing new employees to participate in the plan. So maybe you don't intentionally, um, maybe you're not intentionally not allowing a new employee, but someone gets missed, um, you know, then you would have to go through a correction um, process. You want to make sure that you know your plan's um, eligibility rules and that you're keeping up with that. Not capping matching contributions based on annual compensation cap. So, um, and I have an example of that coming up too. Um, so that's something that you want to know what the um, annual compensation cap is. For 2022, it's 305,000. I'll give you some examples of these. Um, first is not allowing a participant to roll on time. Here we have ABC Company's plan has no age requirements. So this plan has what we call immediate eligibility, um, but it doesn't offer Steve enrollment into their plan for six months. So poor Steve, he didn't get treated fairly like everyone else. So ABC Company is going to have to make Steve whole by making an employer contribution for the missed deferrals and for the missed employer match. Here's the example with the um, not properly capping the match at the contribution cap. Um, so if a plan's matching formula for 2022 is 50% on the first 6% of an employee of em, employees' contributions, then the maximum matching contribution on any one participant um, is $9,150. And that's because the compensation limit for 2022 is that $305,000. And so how I got the $9,150 is taking that compensation cap of $305,000, multiplying that by the 50% contribution. And if someone um, contributes at least 6% to the plan, multiplying it by that 6%, that gets you the 100, I mean, that gets you the $9,150. Initial eligibility to the plan. 
um, 401k, the maximum wait period that any plan um, can make an employee wait to start contributing to 401k is one year and age 21 with a minimum of two entry dates during the year. Um, you can put on a certain number of hours to be required to gain that one year of service, um, but it can't exceed a thousand hours. So most plans, you know, will define a year of service as a thousand hours. And the age requirement can't be greater than age 21. Of course, the IRS allows you to make a shorter waiting period. That's okay. So if you don't want employees to wait a year, if you just want them to wait six months, you can certainly um, do that on with your plan. Uh, initial computation period for figuring out that year of service is usually um, the anniversary from their date of hire, um, but after that, it typically changes to the plan year. And I have an illustration of this. Let's say someone was hired earlier this year and their date of hire was June 1st, 2022. So their initial computation period that we're going to be looking at is from June 1st, 2022 through June 1st, 2023. If the person works at least 1,000 hours during that time, they'll enter on the next plan entry date. And if they have semi-annual entry dates and it's a calendar year plan, those entry dates will be either January 1st or July 1st. So in this situation, your person hired June 1st of 2022, if worked 1,000 hours during their first year, would enter the plan on July 1st, 2023. If that initial 1,000 hours was not met, then we would look at calendar years. So the first calendar year for this person would start at the beginning of 2023. So if the person worked 1,000 hours from January 1st, 2023 through December 31st, 2023, because they didn't meet it during their first anniversary year, but they met it during this first calendar year, that person would then enter the plan on January 1st, 2024. So if you have a situation though, where there's a rehire, you do want to be careful with that. And certainly, if you have questions about a rehire situation, you know, please feel free to reach out to your account manager at NOVA. Um, we'd always prefer to proactively help you with things um, if you're not sure. But here are the rules for rehires. Um, if you have a formerly eligible employee who has ever had a single vested dollar in the plan, then he or she never loses prior service credits. And no matter how many years um, it has been since they have left you, if they come back as a rehired employee, since they were previously in the plan, they get right back in. If that is not the case, if they never had met the plan eligibility requirements and had um, a vested dollar in the plan, then they will lose their prior service credits after five years of um, one year consecutive breaks in service. And it's really important if that five year break has not occurred that you allow rehires who have not lost their prior service credit to participate in the plan immediately on their date of rehire. So if you're ever not sure about a rehire situation, you know, please do ask. And next up is moving pieces, and I'm gonna trade off to Charlene for that. Thanks, Christine. Christine, can you see my screen here? I can. Awesome. Thanks for um, attending today, everyone. We're gonna go through a couple of additional items here. Um, we've added in here the moving pieces slide, um, similar to what Christine had gone over earlier, discussing the individual roles of each party. 
But we wanted to add this in again because we're going to go through some moving pieces of who is responsible for what. And then we'll go through some loans and distribution basics. Um, of course, participants are already always wanting to know how to get their money out of the plan. So we'll go over those items. And then we're going to go over an annual calendar of what you can expect from year to year. Uh, but again, we just wanted to add this slide in here since we're going to be going over some moving pieces. So as we get started, the first thing that we're going to talk about is how the money gets to the record keeper. So the record keeper, if you remember, is the company that holds the actual assets of the plan. So you will be uploading a spreadsheet typically to a secure website on the record keeper's website. And that information will be kept separately for each participant and each contribution that that participant has. So if you could imagine the spreadsheet would include the participant's name, social security number, and the dollar amount that's to be allocated to each source of money, whether it's pre-tax deferral, Roth deferral, safe harbor match monies, all of those different assets will be uploaded per pay period to the record keeper and then tracked separately at the record keeper. The next item, if you have an employer match contribution, which can either be the discretionary match or the safe harbor match that Christine had talked about, typically employers will want to calculate the match on a pay period by pay period basis. Um, it usually encourages participants when they see the match being deposited each pay period rather than once a year. But we do have um, quite a few employers that only want to make one match each year, one deposit for the match. And so in that case, we will uh, calculate that match at the end of the year when we get your annual census data, calculate that match to you and provide a spreadsheet that has the name, um, social and amount of match to be allocated to each participant that you could then upload to the record keeper. But again, most sponsors will allocate that match pay period by pay period basis. Some payroll companies are able to help you with that calculation and provide it as a memo on each of the payroll stubs. Um, but otherwise, you would need to calculate those matches and deposit them each pay period if that's the route you choose to go. Next, the 5500. The 5500 is an annual return that's required for each retirement plan that is submitted to the Department of Labor. Unless it's a special engagement, NOVA is going to be preparing that 5500 for you. Um, as Christine mentioned, if you would review that draft that we're providing and electronically sign it and submit it to the Department of Labor. And we'll go over the due dates of that on the annual calendar. Next, how does an employee get distribution paperwork when they terminate employment? We suggest the um, best way to do that is to give the participant their distribution paperwork at the same time as their COBRA notices and other forms that may be necessary from the employer's perspective as part of their exit interviews. This will um, do a couple of things. First, it will go ahead and notify the participant that they have money in the plan, but it will also start the clock on what we call involuntary distributions. And involuntary distributions are distributions of terminated account balances that have less than $5,000 in their account. And what that allows you to do is if a participant doesn't take their distribution within 30 days, um, they can take it however they wish, but if they don't take it within 30 days and provide instruction for how they want to take it, then you can force that fund, those funds of less than $5,000 out to a um, IRA outside the plan. And that allows you to keep the plan cleaner so that you don't have to worry about losing those participants. They may move and not inform you of their address. And then you, there are certain uh, notifications that you'll have to give to those participants. And so again, it just keeps the plan clean if you can force as many of those participants out. And so by giving this notification to the participants with their distribution paperwork at their exit interview, we'll start that 30-day clock. So you'll have the specific date that that information was given to the participant, 
and then you'll have the 30 days that you can force to an IRA if needed. The, I um, mentioned that notices are required to be distributed to participants, and there could be quite a few depending on what provisions you have in your plan. Um, the first is going to be the summary plan description, which is a layman's term booklet that's provided to each participant. And so that would be distributed to the participants by you as the plan sponsor. And I normally recommend that that summary plan description be given to each participant with their enrollment materials. And again, that way you know that they're receiving everything at once. The summary annual report, we talked about the form 5500 that's due each year. This summary annual report is typically a one page summary of that 5500 and that's required to be distributed to participants as well. So again, you as the plan sponsor would be um, responsible for that. The next item, special tax notice. The special tax notice typically nowadays is built into the distribution forms from the record keeper. And what it does is it discusses the different tax situations that a participant may incur depending on how they take their distribution. So if they take that distribution in a check, there could be different uh, tax situation than if they roll it over to an IRA, for example. So if that's not included in the distribution form already by your record keeper, then you'll wanna distribute that separately with that termination form. Annual safe harbor notices, as Christine had discussed, there are certain provisions that you can put into a plan that allows you to pass certain testing each year. That is required to be distributed in the form of an annual safe harbor notice. And that safe harbor notice is distributed no later than December 1st, prior to the year that's applicable. So for instance, for 2023, today is the deadline to distribute the safe harbor notices to participants. The next one, 404A5 fee disclosure notices. This is also a participant notice that discusses the fees that are allocated for the plan, whether it's from the funds or if it's a distribution or a loan fee. All of those are discussed in this annual notice that needs to be provided to the participants. And the last item we have here is the annual automatic enrollment notices. So if you have the provision of automatic enrollment in your plan, that notice must be distributed annually. And if you have a safe harbor plan that's also automatic enrollment, we typically um, advise that you distribute those at the same time uh, by December 1st each year. If you do have um, the need for a service to mail out those notices, we do have a sister company, ASS. They would be happy to engage with you to send out those notifications. Nova does not have this service, and so that's why our sister company has this as one of their um, offerings. And so I'll leave this up for a second here so you can get Jake's email address here if that's something that you want to engage them for. And again, that would be distributing all annual notices to the participants so that it will take that off your plate. Next, we're gonna jump right into distribution basics. And there are several reasons that participants can take out money from their retirement plan, but they are pretty specific. Some are not required by the plan, they are discretionary, and some are required. So we'll go over those different requirements. But typically, we want to remember that once money goes into a 401k plan, it becomes subject to certain rules of when it can be withdrawn. So a participant, you know, understands that it's their money and will say that they can take it whenever they want. Unfortunately, the regulations don't allow that. It, it is looked at as a retirement plan, and that's what the purpose was set in there for. And so there's only certain rules a certain reasons why you can take that money out of the plan. The first reason that we'll go over is termination of employment or retirement, age 59 and a half distributions, hardship distributions, 
or if there's a death or a disability. The first one we'll go over is the most commonly used is termination of employment or retirement. And so a participant, once they've terminated employment, can take distribution and do as, it, as, as they wish, whether it's taking it in cash, in check form, moving it to an IRA, or moving it to another employer's retirement plan. And again, that special tax notice would discuss what the tax ramifications are for each of those items. But it is um, important to remember that you can process distribution paperwork or send it into the record keeper prior to the employee's termination date, but it cannot be processed until the termination date has passed and after the final payroll contributions have been received. Age 59 and a half is also usually called in-service withdrawal, and it's because it's just that. It is a optional item that can be put into the retirement plan to allow participants who are actively employed and have reached age 59 and a half to withdraw their funds and move it wherever they wish. There doesn't have to be a specific reason. They just need to have met the requirements of age 59 and a half and actively employed. And this was put into the regulations to allow participants to start readying for retirement so that they can, whether they want to pay bills off or if they want to move the funds to their financial advisor, whatever the reason, they can take those funds out of the plan and they can take a portion. They don't have to take all of it. And it's also important to remember that even if they take a full withdrawal, they can still deposit into your plan. It doesn't prevent them from participating after the withdrawal. Next, we'll talk about hardship distributions. And just like in-service withdrawals at age 59 and a half, hardship withdrawals are optional as well. The plans are not required, again, to offer it, but again, with the 59 and a half withdrawals and the hardship, it just allows a participant some security to know that um, if they want to take a withdrawal from the plan um, for whatever reason might come up, they do have access to it, even if they haven't terminated employment. There are very specific reasons where a hardship can be taken out, and there is typically a 10% early withdrawal tax. And that 10% early withdrawal tax is usually due to a withdrawal prior to age 59 and a half. Here's a listing of the reasons that are allowable under the regulations, purchase of a principal residence, prevent eviction from a home, unreimbursed unre medical expenses, post-secondary education, casualty losses, and burial expenses. In addition to these items, some are available for the dependents as well, not just the participant. So it could give them access to the money in their retirement plan if they have one of these unfortunate events come up. But it is important to note that these are very specific in the guidelines to allow you as the plan sponsor not to have to decide who has a hardship and who doesn't. They're very specific and the participant does need to provide documentation as well. You may remember from maybe a prior plan you had or some of the regulations that were previously in existence, they recently changed, but I don't think a lot of people have become aware of them. So we wanted to add this into our presentation Previously, for a hardship withdrawal, you needed to take a loan first if loans were available in the plan. That's no longer a requirement, so a participant can take a hardship without having to worry about taking a loan. You used to have to stop contributing to the plan for six months after taking a hardship. That's no longer a requirement. Investment earnings on the employee's deferrals used to not be available for hardships. They are now available. Employer contributions can now be available for hardship distributions. And I wanted to just touch on this one for a minute. 
some plan sponsors, even though they're um, generous in adding these provisions to the plan, some plan sponsors do not want participants taking out money that the employer has set aside in the plan for participants. And you can restrict the hardship and in-service withdrawals to just the employee money. So you can specifically state pre-tax deferral, Roth deferral, rollover money, and that would not include the employer funds. But you can add them in if you wish. In addition, safe harbor contributions were not available previously for hardships. They are now available as well. If there's an unfortunate event of the death of your participant, the funds are distributed according to the participant's beneficiary election. It's very important to make sure that your participants turn in that beneficiary election with their fund, um, the election notice with their fund investments. That beneficiary election is usually tracked in your personnel files, um, but it's very obviously very useful when this unfortunate event would occur to know who the beneficiary is. But in the event that the participant has not filled out a beneficiary election form, the regulations state that they are married, their married uh, or their spouse will be the beneficiary of that retirement account automatically unless there's a spousal consent form on file that states that, that spouse has agreed to not be the beneficiary. Lastly, the plan document will tell us how to distribute the account if there's not a valid beneficiary election on file. And the way that that is allocated, um, I don't know if we have a slide here or not, nope. Um, but it's very specific in the plan document. The NOVA plan document first will state spouse, then children, then parents, then the estate. So there's a very specific hierarchy in the plan document if there's not a beneficiary election form. But obviously the last thing we want to do is get into <laughs> middle of a some argument that someone wants to be the beneficiary and unfortunately hasn't been assigned as a beneficiary. So just make sure that those participants are filling out their election forms for their beneficiary. Also for a distribution is age 72. And for those of you who have worked on retirement plans before, you may remember age 70 and a half RMDs, required minimum distributions. The regulations recently changed from 70 and a half to now 72. And this is the age in which the regulations require that participants, certain participants take um, a portion of their retirement plan as a distribution. And so the people who are required to take age 72 distributions are participants who have terminated employment and have reached age 72. And it also includes the owners and family members who have turned 72 but are not terminated. So for the owners and the family members, a little bit different. It doesn't matter if they're terminated or actively employed, they will be required to take age 72 RMDs. And in addition, any of your employees who have terminated employment and are age 72 will also be required to take a required minimum distribution. And just like in-service withdrawals, this doesn't mean that they still can't participate in your plan, but for the owners and family members I'm talking about, because they're still actively employed, they can still contribute to the plan, but they'll be required to take a certain portion of that fund out of the retirement plan. And it's a specific formula that's based on the uniform lifetime table and the regulations. And that is um, used in conjunction with their account balances to determine the amount of the RMD that needs to be taken. Quadros. There, we see these mostly when there's a domestic relations order with a divorce. And so you may get paperwork from your participants in the form of the domestic relations order. And this is usually, well, it's very complicated. So I would say when you receive this domestic relations order, please reach out to your account manager 
or forward directly to our distribution team so that they can review the domestic relations order and make sure it is deemed to be qualified. There are certain items that need to be included in the domestic relations order in order to be qualified. And then once we determine that it's qualified, a portion of the account balance will be distributed to the X spouse. And again, because there's so many things that need to be included in the domestic relations order, the rules are complicated and we want to make sure that it's completed correctly and the people involved get the correct balances. So if you just forward that over to us so we can review those. Next for spousal consent, most plans do not require spousal consent. I would say probably 90% of the plans, maybe higher, do not require spousal consent. If the plan does require spousal consent, as we state here, it's extremely important to get that spousal consent. Um, typically, it's going to be on account balances that are more than $5,000. And so if it's less than $5,000, not going to have to worry about it. But there are certain plans that used to have money purchase pension money that are subject to the spousal consent. And so if that distribution is more than $5,000, it's extremely important to obtain the spousal consent signature as well. Loans, loans are available to be put into the plan document, but it's not required. Again, the in-service withdrawal and hardship withdrawals are not required. Same with loans. But again, I'll just reiterate that it just gives the participants security to know that if they need to take money out, they can. But loans are very popular with participants, and it's because they're borrowing from the plan and it's not a taxable event. So they will take out a portion of their account balance, which is also regulated, and we'll go over those amounts. But that amount is withdrawn from the plan and is amortized, and those amortized um, loan repayments come back through payroll deduction. So they'll be set up through the payroll, and those will be deposited by the plan sponsor with any contributions as well. The rules on the loans, participants may borrow the lesser of 50% of their vested account balance or $50,000. So in no circumstances, they're going to be a loan of more than $50,000. And because there's a 50% rule, no more than 50% of their account balance, we also have a minimum loan that can be taken of $1,000. So looking at that 50% of their vested account balance, in order to receive a $1,000 loan, they would need to have at least $2,000 vested in their account to receive that loan. So it's not going to be made for small loan amounts. Um, it's not meant to be a savings account. It's meant very specific for specific reasons. Um, a participant does not need to show documentation for a loan that's withdrawn, as long as it's not more than a five-year term. We'll go through a couple more rules here, but the loans do have a reasonable interest rate, which is typically 2% over prime. Again, the loans must be repaid within five years, unless it's for a residential mortgage loan. So if the participant is taking a loan for a mortgage that they need certain amount of funds for, they can take that distribution for more than five years. But this is when they do need to provide documentation. So the participant will need to provide some kind of documentation that it's for a res residential loan, and then it can be taken for more than five years. Otherwise, all of the loans are going to be less than five years. Again, loans are typically paid through payroll deduction. So this allows you to have a very specific payroll deduction for that participant and not have to track them down for payment of the loan because we don't want those loan repayments to be late and incur a penalty, which would be paid by the plan sponsor. So we would always advise that on any payroll, any loan repayment be made through payroll deduction and the plan documents will be marked as so. 
Also, if a participant terminates employment, that loan is going to become due upon termination of employment. They do have some options as far as paying the loan off, but because there's not going to be any payroll deductions, there's no other payments that are able to be made other than a final payment of the amount due. But if a participant does terminate employment and for whatever reason doesn't want to repay the loan, then they will just receive a 1099 for the amount that's still outstanding for their loan balance say that they have $5,000 still due on their loan, they'll receive a 1099 for $5,000 and it will become a taxable item on their tax form for that year. There are fees that have to be um, um, applied to loans. There could be a loan initiation fee also at the record keeper, there might be an annual or monthly maintenance fee. And the participants bear the cost for the loans as well as any distribution fees. So the participants, once they receive a loan or a distribution, that fee will come out when the um, proceeds are distributed as well. The fastest way to get a loan is to apply online if the record keeper allows that functionality and also for the participant to request an ACH debit instead of a paper check. We kind of flew by those um, loans and distributions in the, in the, um, because of the time limit that we have, but if you have any questions that you wanna specifically go over, just add them into the, the comments as was stated earlier, and we will email you with those answers. But I did want to go through an annual calendar because I think it's important for you to understand what is expected of you throughout the year. And, you know, we're in December, so we're almost starting the new year here. Um, but in uh, some of these, I'm going to skip over because they're repetitive depending on the provisions of your plan. But I did want to point several out. Um, in January, there's going to be 1099s that are going to be distributed by the record keeper no later than January 31st. And just as I talked about, about a loan default or if a participant takes a distribution, they'll receive that 1099 so that they can apply it to their tax return for that year. Also in January, NOVA is gonna start sending out the um, data requests for the census data that Christine had talked about. That census data is necessary for us to complete the annual compliance and testing for the, plan, for the annual plan year. So it's important that you get that data to us as soon as possible. You know, first, first in kind of thing, first out, the sooner you can get the data to us, the sooner we can get it back to you and get any results and calculations to you. February, we're gonna be continuing to work on the annual compliance testing if you already haven't submitted your census data in January, please do so in February, because in March we have a big date here. We have a uh, testing refund that's due by March 15th. In order to get anything processed by March 15th, any of these refunds, we have to finish the testing and provide you with signature ready forms in order for the record keeper to have processed. So there's a lot of information that needs to be completed and provided in order to meet that March 15th deadline. So if your plan is not safe harbor and typically has refunds due to failed deferral and match testing, get that data to us as soon as possible. In April, April is the first deadline for age 72 distributions. So for anyone who is newly turned age 72 and were terminated, they'll be due that first distribution by April 15th. April is also the month in which excess 402G, 402G refunds need to be processed. This is for participants who have gone over the um, deferral limit for that year. I see here we have an old uh, slide of plan year 2020, um, but whatever the requirements are for that year, for instance, 2022, want to make sure that they're processed no later than April 15th. This typically happens when you have a participant who has 
deferred at their prior employer and has come to you in the same year that they've deferred. And between the two, they've deferred too much. So they typically will not remember that they did that until they get their W-2s from each employer and then be told you've gone over the 42G limit between these two employers and they'll have to take a distribution. In May and June, <clears throat> excuse me, May and June, NOVA is going to be working on the Form 5500. So um, again, we're going to finish your compliance testing first, and then we're going to move over to the 5500 that's due each year. And the due date for the 5500 is going to be June 30. I'm sorry, July 31st. So we'll, <clears throat> so we'll need to get the compliance testing and the 5500 completed and filed. And if we have all of the data that we need, we will provide that 5500 to you by June 30th to give you a full 30 days in order to review that 5500 and electronically file it. If you have a large plan, as Christine had gone over, a plan that has more than 100 participants, you're going to be needing an audit as well. And I would say to get that audit started as early as possible. I have some clients, we have audits started in April and May, so that they are wrapping up by July 31st. But for any reason that, that that audit's not completed, we can put your 5500 on exemption to October 15th. So October 15th will be the final due date of any 5500. And there are very large penalties for a late 5500. So we want to make sure that we get that data in and completed, if possible, by July 31st, but no later than October 15th. Let's see. Age 72 distributions. For anyone who's continuing to take an age 72 distributions, for instance, they have received an age 72 and then age 73, and now they're age 74, those um, recurring distributions will need to occur by December 31st of each year. And I had mentioned about the notices. I want to point out this um, block here. Please make sure that any of these three notices are provided to participants by December 1st. So if you have um, a safe harbor notice or an auto enrollment notice that you've not distributed, please make sure you're distributing that today. And again, I know that we went through that last portion very quick, so just let us know if you have any questions. We do have, um, I think this is the last webinar for 2022, um, but maybe we have some already listed for 2023, but just visit our website periodically for those schedules. And then also just a reminder, if you need a CPA credit to make sure that you fill out that evaluation survey, and then you'll be receiving a certification within an within a week of this presentation. I'm going to give a slide here of our information if you have any questions you want to specifically email us to. Um, but do you guys have anything additional to say? Um, we, did have, we had two questions, but I don't know if you want me to just go ahead and forward those over to you guys to answer. Sorry for anybody. Hang on. Okay. Um, so one question is on stolen monies from a 401k account, how does a participant get reimbursed? What was the first part of that? On uh, stolen monies from a 401k account, how does the participant get reimbursed? That's a good question. That's going to end up being through um, legal um, matters. And I've not been involved in that myself. Um, so it's going to be a hard wall to climb. Christine, do you have anything to add on that since it's not covered by insurances? No, I agree. I mean, I, I personally haven't been involved with it either. Um, it is a legal matter. Um, you know, that just similar to if you would have money stolen in, from any other account. I would think you'd have to go through similar type processes. Yeah, so I know that some that are because of fraud, um, that would be covered under the fidelity bond. 
But if it's something in regards to, for instance, Christine had covered some of the security breaches, that's going to be even more difficult. So it's really important to make sure that you're following all the security features that we've outlined. And then as well, um, make sure that you definitely have that fidelity bond on file um, that's reported on the 5500 each year for any of the fraud item, fraud and theft that might be covered by that as well. Yeah, yeah, I, I will say that I think it's more difficult to steal money from a 401k plan than um, personal accounts um, because it's in a trust. There's a lot of it's not as easy as someone going into a participant's account and just transferring to a personal account. There's more steps involved that it has to be approved by the plan's trustee. Um, NOVA reviews the distribution request for many of the record keepers that we work with too. Um, you know, and th those are the kind of things we look for. You know, when we're reviewing, if we see anything that looks suspicious, we would question it, like a signature that doesn't look right. Um, a lot of the distribution requests, you know, if they're done on paper, would require signature, but um, you know, it, it's just something that you need to be aware of, um, you know, make sure participants, you know, don't give out um, their passwords or anything, you know, to their account, um, you know, keep that, you know, in, in confidential areas because it, it can happen, you know, we've heard about it happening. Um, it's not something that Charlene or I would normally be involved in because it would go beyond us. Any perfect. And then we have one more that's uh, two questions actually. Um, what sections of the Internal Revenue Code govern profit sharing non discrimination testing? And are they also the sections governing the other types of non discrimination testing described? So most of the regulations are going to be under 401A of the regulations. Um, I don't know the actual specifics to profit sharing versus some of the non-discrimination testing, but we can certainly look into that and get back to that person on the specific regulation numbers. Perfect. All right. Uh, well, I, that is about it. And um, just a reminder, uh, go ahead and fill out the survey at the end of this webinar so we may track who will be needing a certificate. If you have any questions, um, please be sure to email us webinars at NOAA401k.com. I will go ahead and forward any questions we get over to Charlene and Christine. Um, to view any webinars you may have missed and the recording of this session, you can follow us on our YouTube channel, which is NOAA401k Associates or visit our website, which is www.nova401k.com backslash webinars. Thank you, Charlene and Christine for your time today. Um, and thanks again, everyone for joining. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.